Hey everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's no secret that I have a lot of plants and with a lot of plants comes the need to do a whole lot of watering. So I thought it would be interesting for me to take you along and show you what a typical day or a typical week looks like for me and my plants. It's Saturday morning today and Saturday morning is my favorite time of the week. It's where I get most of my plant care done. So it's where I do the bulk of my watering but also any repotting, pest treatments and so on. Of course, not every week. It depends on, you know, what's overdue or what's due at the time. Today, I'm really just going to focus on taking you along doing all of my watering. Now, of course, it's completely unrealistic to expect that all of my plants can fit into my weekly watering schedule. That is definitely not true or definitely not true throughout all of the seasons. In winter, some of my plants might require less watering than weekly. In summer, some of my plants might require more frequent watering than just once a week. Even right now, some plants require much more frequent watering than just once a week. Saturday morning is the time of the week where I have the most time available. I work during the week, so during the week I really only have a little bit of time available early in the morning or after work to do a little bit of top up or to do you know, a little bit of watering here and there, but I don't really have time to do the majority of my watering. Okay. So when it comes to watering, I actually want to differentiate between two things. I want to differentiate between the watering process and the watering frequency. The watering process is something that is, you know, really up to you and depends on how you're growing things. So the watering process outdoors could be as easy as walking around with a hose. Because I grow everything indoors, I needed to create a watering process that is very clean. I don't want to make any mess. I don't want water to go everywhere. And I obviously want my watering process to be efficient as well. While I absolutely love doing the watering, it's still better to only spend two hours than three hours, right? So watering is definitely a part of the plant hobby that I really enjoy. I see every watering as an opportunity to give my plants what they need to make my plants grow. But of course, I want to find efficiencies where I can. That kind of just comes naturally to, naturally to me anyway. So I can definitely show you a few of the watering, a few of the processes that I've implemented to make my watering as efficient and as clean as possible. When it comes to water frequency, that's where we really need to apply a little bit of common sense or where you can take some of my guidance, but you really need to apply it to your own plants in your environment. The frequency in which you need to water is dependent on so many things. Well, first of all, it's dependent on the conditions. So what season is it? How hot is it? How dry is it? Like what is the natural environment that we're dealing with in the first place? It depends on the size of the pot. A larger pot has more medium, can retain more moisture. A smaller pot, less medium, can retain less moisture. It depends on the medium. How water retentive is your medium? If it's really retentive, then you need to water it less often. If it's very well draining and aerated, very chunky, then you might need to water it more often. How big is the plant? How big is the root system? What type of plant is it? Different species have different requirements. Different species can tolerate drying out better than others and so on. So when it comes to water frequency, that is probably the hardest part to get right. And by no means do I want to say that you should water all of your plants once a week. But realistically, you probably have time to do all of your watering once or twice a week or maybe only once every two weeks. So there's a few strategic decisions you can make to kind of make your plant water requirement meet your needs. So for example, I use a very chunky aeroid mix. That chunky aeroid mix is super aerated and well draining, which means that I'm not really worried about overwatering. Even if a plant doesn't necessarily require watering, if I would water it every week because all of the water just really drains out of the pot, I wouldn't necessarily be too worried about causing any root rot due to overwatering. So, if, but if you use a medium that is not so chunky and well draining, then you might get away with only watering every couple of weeks. So, if you don't have that much time available, then maybe that would be a better option for you. So, so there's a few strategic decisions you can make in relation to the potting medium, the pot size, which plants you're getting in the first place, whereabouts you're placing them in your apartment to make it work for your watering um, availability, let's say. But realistically, you're probably going to choose the pot size, the potting medium, the location of the plant and so on based on what gives the plants the best ability to mature or gives the plants the best opportunity to actually grow as nicely as possible. And then you work your water, watering routine around that, or at least that's what I've done. 
just wanted to get that out there straight away so you know today please take any sort of tips from our watering process when it comes to watering frequency please please always apply common sense please always look at your plants and assess whether your plant actually needs watering rather than just following a guide that said well i should be watering every five days so i did it man anyway all right, before we move around the apartment and we actually go ahead and do all of the watering, I thought it would be just interesting to show you what I actually, what, what I do or what my setup is to make it as efficient as possible. So I've got a 20 liter water tank and I actually fill that up with filtered water. So I've got a, um, fil I've got a water filter from a company called PSI Water. Um, it's, not, it's a really small Australian company and it was just recommended to me by a friend. Um, it just attaches to my laundry sink and I can fill up uh, one of these uh, big boys uh, pretty quickly. So it filters the water and then also remineralizes the water. It was actually meant to be for me to drink and I drink that water. That's predominantly uh, what, what I use it for. But I figured, well, if I already filter water for myself, might as well give my plants that filtered water as well. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. I have all of these one liter bottles. So because I always use the same bottle of water over the years, I've gotten really good at knowing how much water each plant needs or how much water each moss pole can take and so on. So it's kind of nice to have a consistent measure of, um, of, of, of water um, rather than just, uh, just going by like a big bucket or something like that. And then I have my liquid nutrients, GT foliage focus. I use that weekly, weekly. So five milliliters of foliage focus per liter of water. So it works really well with that liter bottle. Um, and I use that with every watering that I do uh, on a Saturday. So I'll pop that in here and then I'll just. Beautiful. I've got little holes in the bottle cap. And that will come in really handy when we look at watering moss pots in a second. I always have ready to be used bottles of water in my cupboard. So I've got a section in my cupboard where I literally just keep them. The reason why I do that is that when I walk around my apartment in the morning or after work one day and I notice that a plant needs watering, I have removed any sort of barriers for me to procrastinate or not do it. It's literally as easy as just grabbing it from the cupboard popping it upside down on a moss pole and that's it. So there's nothing stopping me from doing the watering as soon as I actually notice that the plant needs watering. If you actually need to, oh, I need to fill up the bottle first, I need to find the fertilizer, I need to do that, then maybe you kind of forget about it. So I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for future Jan to actually do the right thing at the right time. Um, and I just love being organized. I think it just really helps. Then, of course, I also have this spray bottle. That spray bottle I mainly use when I water some of my smaller plants on poles, um, but also I use this to just spray leaves. I'm um, sorry. And I don't, do, I don't do that every Saturday, but at least once a month or so, I want to make sure that every plant has had the chance to either go to the balcony or the bathtub and just had a thorough, thorough shower. I just want to spray all of the leaves to get any dust and uh, cat hair off it so that the plants can actually, you know, optimize the photosynthesis um, and also clean leaves are a preventative for pests. So the healthier your plant, the less likely you're going to have pests and, and, you know, keeping these leaves nice and clean and, um, and dust free is really going to help with your plant health. But that is completely unrealistic to do that for every plant every week. I have way too many plants and they're way too big. So, um, you know, I do that here and there. I don't really have a schedule for that just as I see it's required. Anyway. Plenty of introduction. Let's get started. As I said, I'm pretty organized with my process and I, I kind of like, you know, I established a process for myself and I pretty much just follow it um, every Saturday. So I always start off with my non moss pole plants and let's start off in the kitchen first. Come on. Yeah, I know the lighting isn't the best, but you know, you're going to get a realistic view into what watering looks like for me. Um, so I'm going to water my alocasias first. While they're all in this huge decorative planter, they are all potted up individually. Whoop, there you go. So that way I can water each plant individually based on its watering requirement. Not all of them might require watering at the same time or in, in that same frequency. It really depends on how large the plant is, how many roots it's got, what type of plant it is, and so on. But usually I water all of my alocasias once a week. So I just got the setup over here in my kitchen. Um, 
over the sink and I have a bucket over here. Alrighty, so you can see I love using these see-through pots and you can see all of these roots in here, beautiful. I can feel by the way it definitely needs water and I can't see any air, um, I can't see any evaporated water on the side of the pot, which is a good sign that this probably needs some watering. So all I do is I'll just take my water, I water it over a nice bucket that just catches any of the excess. And I'm going to use all of that excess water later on to water the plants on my balcony. So I'll just do that and I'll pop it over the sink to let it drain for another 5 to 10 minutes. And I'll move on to the next plant. All right, let's have a look at this one over here, for example. So this is a much smaller plant compared to the ones we've seen before. It only has two leaves, right? So because it only has two leaves, of course, it also doesn't need watering that much. So you can see that this potting medium looks much wetter, much uh, shows more moisture. Of course, you can also stick your finger in it to feel it, but I can already see it through the pot that this doesn't actually need watering. I can also feel it. So I don't water it every week, no matter what. I do assess every single pot by the look, by the feel. Um, and by the weight um, to, to, you know, to see whether it actually needs watering or not. So this one, I'll just pop back in. No need to do anything. Alrighty, we move on to some other plants. All right, this plant over here, for example, definitely requires some watering, but it's an alocasia and it's probably the worst alocasia for spider mites. So I can see a few spider mites over here. Yeah, let's see if you can see this here. Yeah, I think you can see that over here. So see how these little webs in between the leaves? That is a sign of spider mites. Like that's actually a pretty late sign of spider mites. You can catch them much earlier. To be honest, I mean, I don't even look at this plant and to see whether it has spider mites or not. I know that this has spider mites at all times. So I'm gonna water this plant, but I'm gonna put it in the bathtub so I can water it in the bathtub and at the same time I can treat it for pests. So for now, I'm just gonna put it aside. And when we go through the whole living area, as I go through it, I'll check every plant for pests and I keep putting them on the same pile and then um, we'll do it later. So for now, I'll just maybe, I'll just, I'll just pop it here for now and then we'll pick it up later. All right, we worry about all of the moss pole plants later. So let's move on to some other non-moss pole plants. Alrighty, so um, depending on the size of the plant, like this plant, for example, it's unrealistic for me to take this plant to the sink to water it. Uh, and also it's just not really needed. So from now on, we kind of just move around the apartment with the bucket and with those bottles of water. But um, some plants I might take back to the sink and water them over there. Now, this plant is a canna lily and canna lilies are super, super thirsty. So this is actually in a mix that is, whoop, has some good roots. This is in a mix that is uh, much, much more water retentive. So it's pretty much just half cocoa peat, half perlite. Um, and you can't really ever overwater this. So it is not an aeroid. It doesn't have this large chunky aeroid mix. It has much finer roots and it really doesn't like drying out. It's more of a swamp plant almost. So you can really water this like crazy. This is one of these beautiful pot and planter combinations where the pot fits perfectly on top of the planter. So this plant just hovers over the planter and any excess water can just drain into the planter over here. So I can water this as much as I want without actually having to take it out of its planter, without having to take it out of its spot. And I know that I still have sufficient drainage and there's just going to be a little bit of water accumulating at the bottom of the planter. And what I've noticed is I don't empty that out because I actually noticed that roots are really attracted to that water and roots start growing crazy. They do grow out of the pot, but I'm not worried about it. It's almost like I'm doing hydroponics and I wasn't planning on doing it. Very similar to that is my oxalis. It's also a non aeroid plant, so it also doesn't have these chunky roots and it really, really doesn't like drying out. So I water this probably every couple of days, actually. So I just pour a little bit of water over here. Honestly, I don't think you can really overwater this plant either. Um, the water, again, it's in a, in a mix of half cocoa peat, half perlite. So the mix in itself is much more water retentive. Um, it also has a bit of drainage at the bottom of the pot. The pot isn't sitting right in that excess water. So it has really, really fine roots and these fine roots really don't like drying out. So I'm not worried about potentially overwatering this plant. I'm only worried about underwatering this plant. 
But the plant in itself is usually pretty good in telling you when it's thirsty or not. Um, these leaves can get really droopy um, and, and really show you when it needs watering. Uh, so this is uh, variegated Berla marks and you can see how many roots there are. And you can really see all of these air pockets in my aeroid mix. That's what makes it so well draining and aerated. All of these chunky materials form all of these pockets of air. And uh, there you can see that water condensation on here as well. That just really shows that there's like a lot of humidity in there, um, which really attracts the roots, which makes the roots grow, grow crazy. Now, there are a lot of plants in here. I think there's four or five plants. I just recently propagated them and potted them in here. That's why there's so many roots. I'm expecting the plant to eventually catch up with leaves as well. So I think I can water this today without any worries. And I mean, you can see, I mean, you can really see how well that water drains out of there straight away. All right, so let's have a look at the last non moss pot plant in this corner, my Thai constellation. So the issue I've got here is it's not in a see-through pot. And I've really noticed that I've become so reliant on these see-through pots to really assess whether my plant needs watering or not. So I'm really struggling with plants that are not in see-through pots at the moment. Um, the only reason it's not a clear pot is because they don't make the clear pots in that size. And because this plant is a crawler, I needed to give it a little bit more room. Like it's not a crawler. I'm growing it as a crawler. Uh, I needed to give it a little bit more room inside the pot. So I gave it that larger 25 centimeter pot. Now, the best way for me to actually check this is really check based on the weight or putting a finger in it. But the mix is so chunky, it's really hard for you to actually understand if there's moisture in it. Also, moisture meters won't work. This mix is so chunky and aerated, your moisture meter is just going to hit one of these air pockets in the mix and it's always going to tell you that it's dry. I've tried it plenty of times. Any moisture meter I've ever used on any of my mixes always says that my mix is dry, despite the fact that I might have just watered it and my eyesight and the, everything else tells me that it's wet, the moisture meter will always tell me it's dry. These moisture meters work a treat if you have a really fine medium, like it would work for like my oxalis or it would work for my canna lily, it would work for like a begonia or a fern, but for aeroids, these moisture meters are useless, so don't bother. Now, I can tell that by the way, this is okay. I think I can water that. Plus, it has a new leaf popping out. So I know that it's going to need a little bit more water because, well, what else is that leaf going to fill itself with? So I'm going to go ahead and give this a watering, but I'm going to do that over the sink. So come with me. Pop this back into the planter. Oh, and it's time for the tie. So when I water, like I always like to water a lot. I really want the water to flush out at the bottom. Um, I read something on, on an Instagram story yesterday. You want to give your plants a shower, not a bath. And I think it makes so much sense. You really want to shower that plant. You want to see all of that water drain out. So I'll pop this on like an angle over here. Let's do it this way. So any excess water can drain out and I'll give this like 30 minutes or so to fully drain. All right, and I've got my Anthurium vitarifolium over here. Same deal with this. I'm just going to give it some thorough watering. Making sure that there's plenty of water really draining through at the bottom. And I'll let it drain. All right, let's keep moving through the apartment. Um, I've got a little Monstera over here. You can tell it's in, it's in a really dark spot, right? It's because I don't really care about it too much. I've got a bunch of these um, um, Adansoni eyes, but it really doesn't mind, actually. It doesn't mind this dark spot, but it is in a much darker spot than any of the other plants, or so it would require watering less frequently because it has less access to light, less growth, less temperature, and so on. So... Uh, let me just assess whether it needs watering or not. All right, so you can see over here, I can't really see any water condensation on the side of the pod, which to me is a sign that I can easily water this. There isn't that much water retained in the potting medium at the moment.
Watering plants like that, so giving them like a proper shower, making sure that all of the water drains out and then popping them back, also aerates the mix. So it flushes out any sort of mineral buildup. It also oxygenates the actual mix. So aeroid roots love oxygen. So flushing the water through it like that compared to like bottom watering, for example, really helps with bringing that oxygen into the pot, flushing out the minerals. So it's really good for your root health, um, or like your plant's root health. We keep on moving. So there's a little plant over here. Same applies over here. It's quite far away from any window, so it doesn't get much light. I'm actually surprised it's still alive. Um, you can see that they have a lot of roots that are actually grown out of the pot. Um, it's an anthurium. So it really doesn't mind keep staying moist, right? So if this was a Monstera, for example, I probably wouldn't water it. But because it's an Arthurium, it really doesn't mind uh, the moisture. Plus, you can see how chunky that aeroid mix is there. When I water this now, like there's not going to be much water actually retained within the pot. Most of it is just going to drain straight out. But yeah, keep in mind, I'm making these decisions whether I should water the plant or not based on knowing how chunky my aeroid mix is. Really, the consistency of your mix is so important when you assess whether or not your plants should be watered. If I would have a finer mix, I would need to water way less often. All right, let's move on to the next plant over here. I only potted this up a couple of weeks ago, so I can't see any roots on the, on the side of the pot yet. Oh, maybe a little one over here. But again, you can see how chunky this mix is and how like fluffy and aerated it is. So I don't think there's any risk in watering this. When I stick my finger in it, honestly, I can't feel any moisture. So I'm going to water this. All right, uh, let's have a look at this one. So this is a Monstera and you can see, I mean, hopefully, hopefully the camera picks this up, but you can see that the color of the mix is much darker, which shows me that it has retained more moisture. You can see little um, water evaporation over here. Plus it's a Monstera, so I'm not going to water this. Monsteras can definitely tolerate drying out a little bit more than an Anthurium or an Alocasia or um, a Philodendron, for example. Next one, we've got my Cupria over here. If we're having a look, again, very nice and healthy roots. Uh, there is a little bit of water actually on the outside of the pot. That's because the pot and the planter have a very snug fit. So you can see that the color of the medium is quite dark. You can see a little bit of water condensation in these air pockets over here. So I don't think I need to water this, but alocages are notorious for spider mites. So let's have a quick look if I can see any spider mites. Wow, I think that's the first. There's no spider mites on here. So I'll pop that back in and we'll see if we're as lucky next week. Alrighty, more moss pots over there. Again, we're worrying about all of the moss pots later on. Let's worry about all of the non moss pot plants first. Good news is I don't have that many non moss pot plants, so this is going to be a pretty quick process. So, a couple more over here. I've got a Bosworth Beauty over here. I've got this in this weird pot. I really, I really want to change the pot, but uh, it's still growing, so don't fix what's not broken. But this pot, um, it's like, I think they call it like a spiral pot or something like that. Basically, it has a lot of holes, right? At the bottom as well as on the side which means that there's a lot of aeration in here, which means that this medium dries out pretty quickly. So, which means that I can pretty confidently water this once a week without actually really checking on, on the medium in itself. I just know purely based on the aeration that I don't worry about overwatering. All right, next one, we've got a Regal Shields. Again, the mix looks pretty dark and I can see all of that water condensation over here. So I'm not going to water this uh, because I think this is still sufficiently moist. Also, I checked the weather forecast. It's going to be another rainy and humid week in Sydney anyway. So if I would know that the coming week has like 40 degrees forecasted, it's going to be really dry, then I would probably water it in anticipation. But I know that this can definitely survive another week. And if, I mean, I check my plants throughout the week anyway, if it shows major signs of being really thirsty, then I'll obviously water it. 
Um, but I'm confident this can wait to the next week, Saturday instead. All right, moving on to some of my crawlers. I've got a Dean McDowell over here. I've got a um, Mame over here and a Gloriosum over here. And the Dean and the Gloriosum just recently had a repot and I repotted them into quite large rectangular pots. These rectangular pots took a lot of medium. I underestimated how much medium fits in here. It's actually super heavy as well, but there is a lot of medium in this pot. I also made the medium a little bit more water retentive, so it's a little bit more cocoa peat heavy. So I haven't watered this in two weeks and uh, just sticking my finger in there, I can still feel plenty of moisture. So I'm not going to water this again. I'm notorious for overwatering my crawlers. Like I've never had any issues with my moss pot plants, but my crawlers always get root rot from me over watering. So I'm going to be a little bit more careful and I'm just going to let that slide for another week. Um, also, again, it's going to be a rainy week, so I'm not worried about this plant using a whole lot of water, despite the fact that it actually pushes out a new leaf over here. The Gloriosum is also, just checking the mix, is also fine. I only potted that up last week, Saturday. So that's only been in this mix for one week, so I don't think it needs watering. I'll give it another week and I'll reassess next week. And somewhere down here, I've got my mame. Now, the mame again is in these smaller pots that have this water reservoir down below. So I don't need to water this at all. It seems very, very moist still. But my mame always has spider mites. All right, last couple of non moss pot plants. Hey, Brad. Um, I've got two Scandapsis over here. As you can see, they're in a really dark corner, right? So I'm not expecting them to use a whole lot of water because they don't get that much sunlight. And I've got them in plant uh, pots. I've got them in pots that perfectly fit on that planter. So again, the pot is kind of sitting on the edge of the planter, meaning that the bottom of the pot doesn't actually reach the bottom of the planter. So when I water it, there's a little bit of water going into the bottom of the planter and then it attracts the roots. So I've kind of created like this hydroponic setup, like by accident. Whoop, go back in there. So whenever I do water it, I honestly just water it and I don't even empty the excess. It's like super, super low maintenance. I maybe every couple of weeks, I just go here and I just chuck a little bit of water on it. These plants just tell you when they want water. The leaves will start curling. Now these are like slightly curled, but I definitely think they can go for another week without watering. Again, considering that it's gonna be a really wet and humid week in Sydney anyway. So I'm not gonna do anything over here, especially because they don't get a whole lot of sunlight anyway. So those were all of the non moss pot plants in my living room. The only thing we've now got left is obviously the moss poles and my IKEA cabinet. All right, let's move on to the IKEA cabinet. The IKEA cabinet has one big advantage over the normal living area. There is way less fluctuations in conditions inside the IKEA cabinet than outside, right? That cabinet is sealed. It is uh, like the, I didn't seal the middle bit, so there's a bit of exchange of air. But all of the other doors are sealed, meaning that there isn't that much air exchange in there. The humidity in there is pretty much at like 90 to 100 percent at all times it's so high my little humidity measure actually broke because it was too humid so um, i don't actually measure the humidity in there but i can tell by the condensation on the glass that it must be really high humidity in there also the temperature is more consistent because you've got the grow light producing heat but you also have a fan producing good airflow. So overall, there's very consistent conditions in there. Temperature, humidity are very consistent. There's consistent airflow, which usually makes plants dry out a little bit quicker, but given the high humidity, it kind of balances itself out. So basically, where am I going with this? The, there isn't that many changes between summer and winter because in winter, this is still fairly warm because of the grow light. And in summer, it doesn't heat up that much because it's not that uh, close to any of the windows. So it doesn't actually get any sunlight exposure. So I'm pretty much just giving it the same treatment all year long. But there are some smaller plants like this one, for example, it's in a teeny tiny pot. Um, I actually spray this halfway through the week um, and any of the moss really 
uh, all of my anthuriums have like a layer on, of moss on top uh, and that moss is really to encourage root growth and redirect the roots into the potting medium. I spray the top layer of moss uh, usually every Wednesday, so halfway through the week, just so it stays moist and then I water the whole pot every Saturday. I'll take all of them to the sink and water them there, let it all drain thoroughly. Uh, this one, for example, I won't actually water today. It is uh, just growing from a little stump, so the leaves are still tiny. So there isn't really much using the water. It still has a quite, uh, quite, it has a large root system, so that's why I gave it a large pot. But that means that this pot can just retain plenty of moisture because there's not much moisture used by the plant in itself. So I water this every fortnight maybe. But plants like this, for example, it's a papillomenobulum, don't know the name. It's in quite a small pot and it has quite a lot of roots in this small pot. Right? So you can pretty much just see roots. It's definitely a need for a repot, not today, next week maybe. Um, and you can see all of these aerial roots on the side over here. And that's where, you know, I want them to make you, I want them to touch the moss and then start growing into the pot. So this is quite a large plant in quite a small pot. So I definitely uh, need to water this weekly. Once I repot it into a larger pot at the beginning, weekly might be a little bit too frequent. But yeah, as I said, I always assess every single plant whether or not it needs watering, but I'm not super worried about overwatering due to my potting medium. But this one definitely gets the water today. Unrelated to the watering, look at this beautiful new leaf that just unfurled. Woohoo! Uh, same over here. There's quite a, there's a lot of roots in this pot over here, right? And so it definitely needs watering. So this one is living at the bottom of the cabinet. So it gets less light, it gets less airflow. Um, so you can see that this, the medium still looks really dark and has plenty of moisture. So this one won't get watered today just because it has much less exposure, right? Of course, over here, if you're right next to the fan, right next to the light, you're going to use more water uh, than if you're all the way at the bottom over there. See how all of these roots are growing into the moss and then from the moss into the pod. Definitely needs a repot. I'll get onto that next week or so, but I spray the moss. The moss is really, really dry right now. That's, that's not really what I like. I usually spray the moss uh, like on a Wednesday or a Tuesday, so sometime halfway do, uh, through the week, but today it's going to get a thorough watering and a good uh, flush through. Anything that I just have in moss, like this Adansonia, you can see it has plenty of roots. You can also see that there's a lot of water condensation on the side of the pot. So this doesn't need watering. Whenever I have moss, I don't ever really water it thoroughly because it's just too much water. I just spray the surface a little bit because of course the surface dries out first. And that's just to encourage more of these roots to actually attach to the moss. Um, but yeah, it's doing quite well. It gets quite a lot of light over there. Uh, same with these little pots over here. There's some little seedlings in there. I just give the top layer of moss a little spray. That's it. I don't need more watering. So I'll take these to the sink and then I'll pick up the big queen. Alrighty, I'll take my queen as well. The queen is definitely thirsty. So halfway through the week, I also give the queen a little spray top up. Um, but every Saturday I water her thoroughly. I'm also gonna leave the, the doors open a little bit just to get a bit of fresh air in here. Right, so I just take them all to the sink. I know you can probably hardly see what I'm doing because I'm filming against the window, but I have no other option. That sink is right next to the window. But basically the reason why I take them to the sink to water them thoroughly is because these are not in planters, right? Planters would be way too heavy to hang up in my IKEA cabinet. So they're just, uh, I just use these little clips. Right, I just use these little clips over here that just connect to the, uh, to the grid in my cabinet. And I've got a full video on my IKEA cabinet setup uh, and all the plants within it as well. So feel free to check that out. But um, because I just clipped the nursery pots to the grid in the back, um, obviously any excess water wouldn't be caught by a nursery pot, like a planter. It would just drip through and basically would make the cabinet all messy um, and potentially drip out of the cabinet onto the floor. Um, obviously, there's all of, also some electricity involved with the cabinet, with the grow light and so on. So I want to make sure that it is a, a clean process. And ultimately, if I just take them to the sink and I water them thoroughly over here, let all of the excess water drain through. So I'm going to 
let them dry for a good 30 minutes after I water it and then I pop them back in, then I actually make less mess inside my cabinet. Happy days. So I'll just do that real quick. You don't need to, you can't see what I'm doing anyway, so might as well not watch. All right, while the Anthurians are draining before I can pop them back into the IKEA cabinet, let's now finally focus on the moss poles. Watering moss poles is actually the easiest part of my watering routine. So I get, oh, brattles, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> getting a bit distracted. I get the, I get watering all my other plants, including the IKEA cabinet out of the way first, because that's the least enjoyable part to me. It's kind of a little bit annoying. I'm moving around a lot and it's really involved. Watering moss poles is honestly so easy. Um, if you use the upside down bottle technique that I showed you in my previous watering tutorial already. <coughs> oh, look at him. Alrighty, Brettles, I'm going to leave you here and I'm going to do some watering, okay? Daddy loves you. All right, so the idea behind it is that I have holes in the bottle cap. It doesn't matter how many holes, it doesn't matter how big the holes are. Honestly, I've, I've done it with larger holes, smaller holes, three, four, it always works. The idea behind it is that water is slowly being released from the bottle and the moss can absorb the water. Basically, as long as the moss can absorb the water faster than the water is being released from the bottle, it's going to be clean. And that's the main incentive behind this. I want this to be a clean process. I can't really move all of my moss poles. They're way too large. I need to water them in the spot that they're currently in, but I don't want to make a mess on the walls. So I don't like to use a sprayer. I don't want to make a mess on the floor. So I need to make sure that this is a clean process. So I found this to be, um, that works really well for me. So that was in relation to the bottle. Now on the moss pole, um, I actually create like a little cavity at the top to fit the bottleneck in. And I just create a little hole just with my finger, honestly, don't overthink it. Just so the holes at the top won't be blocked by all of the moss. So all I really got to do is I take the bottle, I flip it on top of the moss pole and now gravity should do its thing and slowly release the water. I'm so the moss pole is now just going to drink up. Sweet. So let's repeat this with all the other moss poles. But of course, that is just the process. Again, we're differentiating between the process and the frequency. This is the process. But first, I need to actually assess whether this pole needed watering. I hope it does because it's kind of too late now. How do I assess whether my pole needs watering? I just do the crunch test. And I hope the mic is going to pick this up. that's dry. I do the crunch test all the way to the bottom. And you can hear that you can hear the bottom of the pole isn't as crunchy as the top because that's obviously uh, gravity is going to make the water drain through. So the top of your moss pole is always going to dry out first. So when I decide whether or not I need to water a moss pole, I don't just test the top of the moss pole because the top of the moss pole doesn't really matter if the plant hasn't reached the top of the moss pole. Really what matters is the bottom of the moss pole. So if the bottom of the moss pole is still like no crunch, still moist, then I'm not going to water it. If the bottom of the moss pole starts being crunchy, then I'll pop a bottle upside down. So this one, I probably wouldn't really need to water it. So I'm actually going to stop this, but it was a good way for, to you, for me to show you because the bottom of the pole is still um, a little bit moist. Now, let me show you something else. With this plant, you would think that the plant hasn't really climbed up its moss pole that far. Really, the, the newest node is only here. And most of its root system is really within the pot. You can see that there's also a little bit of water evaporation. So I don't ever actually water the pot. The pot just gets watered by any water from the pole dripping down. So I'm, I only water the pot when I first pot up the plant and then afterwards all watering is done through the pole. But this plant, very similar to the Atavapoensi, is actually throwing out roots that are climbing up the moss pole. So while the plant has only reached to about here, I can see a root uh, climbing up into the moss pole and I don't know where it stops. It could be all the way to the bottom. Uh, it could be all the way to the top. My Atavapoensi actually had... Uh, a few roots coming out the top of the moss pole. So 
whenever we're talking about watering, and I get that question quite a bit, do you water the pot or do you water the moss pot? I water the roots. I don't water the, the moss pot or the pot in itself doesn't need watering. We're watering because we want to water the roots. So you water the medium that contains the roots. If there's no roots in the moss pot, you don't need to water the moss pot. If there's no roots in a pot, you wouldn't need to water the pot. But I suppose to make this plant happy, you would want roots to be all over the pot and all throughout the moss pot as well. So that's why I then water both. Also, roots seek moisture. So I want to keep the moss pot moist so that roots are attracted to it and start growing into it. But definitely at the very beginning, when you're still establishing a plant on a moss pot, you might get away with just watering the, the, the lower part of it. But I actually like to water the full thing because also what I just mentioned earlier, gravity is going to make all the water drain through. If I only water the bottom part, the bottom is now the top and the bottom dries out really quickly. If I water the full thing, the top dries out first, but I don't care. The bottom is going to stay moist the whole way through though. Anyway, that's a little bit about the theory. So let's walk around the apartment and apply it to the plants. Let's start with the one right next to it. So again, you can't really hear any crunch. So this is still sufficiently moist, but dry moss is hydrophobic. So I want to water this pole before it fully dries out. If I let it fully dry out, the water, when I, when I pour water all over it, water is just going to drip out left, right and center because dry moss can't absorb water. If I water this plant, uh, if I water this pole before the moss fully dries out, I can pretty much, aside the fact that I actually just missed, but any of the water that I pour right on top of the moss pole, it's just going to be absorbed and it's super mess free. So when people ask me how often do you water, well, the frequency is kind of irrelevant. I don't know how frequently because it really depends on how fast the moss pole dries out, which is subject to the weather, the plant and so on. But I don't, I don't like to refer to frequencies. I like to say that I water my moss pots before they fully dry out. I could probably get away watering them less often, but it would make each watering more time consuming and messier. So I'd rather do more frequent watering, maybe two or up to three times a week. Um, but each watering is really, really low effort and really, you know, quick and um, doesn't make a mess. So. Let's have a look. Let's feel the pulse. All right, the top is not even crunchy, so I'm assuming the bottom would definitely not be crunchy. Yep, perfect. This pole is still okay. I'll check in on this one maybe on Tuesday or Wednesday, and then I reckon it'll need some water. My big dubia pole now actually has a plastic backing. That plastic backing reduces the surface area, so it should dry out much, much slower, and I can definitely feel that there is no crunch. So that's still okay. All right, next to it, we've got my Cebu Blue. There is no crunch, but I can feel that the pole is slowly drying out. Now with this one, I actually have an issue <laughs> because it's too tall. I can't flip the bottle upside down. The ceiling is in the way, so what I'm going to do with this one, I water it like every two, three days a little bit just to make it mess free because I can't, like obviously when you pop the bottle upside down, even if the moss pole is really dry because it releases so slowly, it's still mess free. If I just free pour, I need to make sure that that moss is still moist. Otherwise, it's going to go everywhere. Ooh. So I like to just go with a little bit at a time. And you can see the moss at the top was a little bit hydrophobic. So you can see all of that water running off on the side. So what I could do is I could take a spray bottle. I could spray it first. And then once it absorbed a little bit of moisture, then I could start pouring a little bit more water over it. I'm just going to be patient and just water a little bit at a time. Beauty, we'll come back to this later. I let it absorb the water I gave it for now and I'll come back a little bit later and it should be much easier to pour more water over it. Let's move to the other side. Over here we've got a couple of moss pulse. Wow, this one is really dry. Oh yeah. Let me, let's see if you can hear this. I hope you can. It was definitely crunchy.
So sometimes I feel like I'm Oprah and I'm just walking through my apartment. You get a bottle and you get a bottle and you get a bottle. Happy days. All right, one more poll over here. Another thing that I actually wanted to say that I forgot to mention at the very beginning, you know how I filled up that 20 liter container of water? Yes, I use filtered water. I don't think you necessarily need to use filtered water. I'm probably just being extra as always. But um, the other benefit that it has is I keep it in my living area. Um, so it adjusts to room temperature. I don't like to use cold water coming out of a tap for my plants. I like the temperature to be, you know, ambient before I actually pour it down the moss poles, specifically in winter. I'm not so fussed about summer, but in winter, I don't want to water my plants with really cold water. That's also what I don't like about taking them to the shower and using the shower head. I just feel like the water would be a little bit too cold, potentially causing stress for the plant. Keep in mind, these are all tropical plants and in the tropics, the rain would, it would, it would rain, but the rain wouldn't be cold, right? It would be nice and warm. All right, let's move to the other side of the living area and I'll bring all my bottles with me. All right, um, it, lo it looks so empty on this side of the room without, uh, <laughs> with the uh, empty cabinet. So this one also desperately needed one. I mean, let's hear the crunch. Yeah, I mean, it sounds pretty crunchy. But honestly, that's not even the crunchiest it can be. It, become, it can become much, much crunchier um, if it's fully dry. So keep in mind, that's also like, that's pretty much just the surface area being crunchy at this stage. But there's a lot of roots within these moss poles, right? So if I let the moss poles fully dry out and then I water them again, it might actually be that the root's going to die. Roots can't tolerate drying out completely. These are plants from that, come, that grow in a gr tropical climate naturally. It's never dry in a tropical climate. They're always wet. They just want to make sure that there's always aeration and drainage. But with moss poles, there's so much aeration just purely based on the surface area that you don't really have to worry about um, drainage within the moss pole. All right, let's have a look at... Actually, no, let's not have a look at this. I'll, I'll address this one later on when I address all of the smaller poles because... I deal with the smaller poles a little bit differently than I deal with the large ones. So let's just wrap up all the large poles first. All right, let's give these two a bottle as well. I don't know if the camera can pick up on the sound or that all the bottles make, but as the water gets released, it's like, it's giving me like a, a nice beat. So with this one, let's come along. I want to look at this one in a little bit more detail. All right, so over here, I told you before with the biliatii, biliatii, likes to grow roots up the pole. So over here, you can see there's this root at the back of the pole climbing all the way to the top. So I reckon it's going to reach the top of the moss pole really soon. So even though the plant in itself might have only reached but half of the moss pole, the root system might actually be throughout the whole pole. So I'm going to water the whole thing. And you can see that second pole as well. There's some little roots coming out the top of it. Um, I don't really have enough room to pop a bottle on here. So I'll just pour water down here as well. Honestly, any excess water that's just going to dribble down into the pot, that's totally fine. I don't water the pot ever. So really just that little bit of leftover water that's running down the side of the pole that's all the pot needs so let me show you something nice with these poles as well so it's another one of those where i have a great planter and pot combination so these are 25 centimeter pots and they fit perfectly on these planters so that the pot in itself is kind of hovering over the planter so there's like this little bit of there's like a little gap down below. So any excess water is just going to accumulate in there and it's really making these roots go crazy. Roots seek moisture. So even if I water this moss pole without it needing water and all of it, all of the water is just going to drain through the pole, through the pot into the planter, it's actually a good thing. I almost want water to accumulate at the bottom of the planter to encourage more roots to grow. So I... 
I can I can water this like as much as I want really. I'm never worried about overwatering the potting medium because it's so well draining. So I'm really just focusing the watering frequency or the watering requirement on the state of the moss pole. I don't care about the pot. Last one over here, this one is still sufficiently moist. So is this one. But I just water a little bit, a little bit at a time. If I just do, if I just water this little bit every two to three days, then it will never fully dry out. So it will never get messy when I rehydrate it. All right, other corner. All right, a couple more plants over here. So this one, definitely the top actually doesn't seem to be too dry. But if I squeeze the bottom, I can definitely hear a bit of a sound. What that really means is that the last time I watered this plant, the water didn't get all the way through. It kind of probably just was enough water to water about three quarters of the moss pole, not all the way. So the bottom is actually drier than the top now. Um, it's funny, a lot of people ask me if I'm worried about overwatering my plants because of the moss pole and the frequency that I water the moss pole in. Actually, I have the opposite problem because I only ever water the moss pole, I never water the pot. And I've gotten so good at knowing exactly how much water my moss pole wants, I sometimes actually underwater the pot. Like I forgot, forget that <laughs> I should water the bottom one as well. I mean, you saw with that Adam Sony I earlier, for example, there was actually no water accumulated at the bottom of the pot, but indicating by the roots, they would probably want a little bit of water down there. So I could probably water it more than I currently do and still not overwater it. So yeah, I think it's all about just making sure that your moss pots are in a really well draining and aerated mix. So make it nice and chunky and light. All right, last one over here. It's a little bit trickier to get to. It's uh, quite a tall pole and it's on like a little cabinet. The taller the moss pole, um, the sooner, the faster it dries out, right? Because number one, gravity, but also all of the heat rises to the top. So at the top, it's actually really warm and dry and the, the bottom is, uh, of the apartment is a bit cooler. So yeah, just keep that in mind. Now, while all of these bottles are emptying, let's have a look at some of the smaller moss poles over here. So with smaller moss poles, obviously, as I said earlier, there is not necessarily the need to water the full moss pole. Again, we're watering the roots. So only the part that the roots have attached to or grown into is really the part that I want to make sure I keep moist. But that doesn't mean that I don't think about what's the most efficient way of watering them. I still think taking a bottle, flipping it upside down is the most efficient way to go with these ones. And I would just put half a liter in it or maybe even less than that, depending on how moist this pole still is. But you can totally get away by spraying it as well. So I've got a good uh, pressure sprayer over here. You could totally just get away by spraying it over here. But a fundamental flaw with this is that you're really just watering the surface area of the moss pole. So it's going to dry out really quickly because you just keep watering the surface. The surface is going to evaporate. The water on the surface is going to evaporate. And so when people message me saying that their moss pots dry out every day, they must either live in a desert or they must never water their moss pulse thoroughly. So I like to water with the bottles because it waters the moss pot from the inside out rather than just from the outside. And as I said, dry moss is hydrophobic. So there's a lot of water actually dripping down into the pot and I don't want to water the pot that much. So I don't think this spraying method is really a great method to water these smaller poles. But what you can do is you could take all of them because they're so nice and small. I could take all of them to the bathtub or to the balcony, spray them overall, making sure that the really dry moss absorbs a little bit of moisture and then I could pour a bit of water over it and it would be really clean. What I also love doing is just taking them all on the balcony on a rainy day and letting the rain take care of it. But if you just quickly have a look to your left, it's very, very windy out there. My balcony is very exposed. So today's probably not a good day to take all of my poles to the balcony and put them there. So um, I'm not gonna take them to the balcony today. I'm gonna keep them exactly where they are. So in a perfect world, what I actually do is I go around every couple of days and I water it a little bit. If I water it a little bit every couple of days, it will never fully dry out, meaning that whenever I pour a little bit of water over it, it will never end up being messy. Now, I was too lazy the last couple of days and all of the tops have dried out. Now, if I want to water them from the top, 
it's going to get a little bit messy. If I want to use this to water it, it's also going to get messy. I no way I can spray all of these poles without spraying all of my walls. So it's probably a good idea to go take them to the bathtub. And then I can do a bit of pest treatment at the same time. But obviously only the ones that actually require watering. So let's have a look. This one. I think you can hear it. It's definitely crunchy and the plant is reaching decent heights. So I'll definitely take this one to the bathtub with me. Have a look at this lupinum. The bottom part of the pole that the plant is attached to is still really moist. I don't know if you can hear that. Well, hopefully you can hear nothing because there is no crunch. So no need to water this. Let's have a look at this one. This is my silver cloud. You can see that there's plenty of roots in the pot in itself. And the pot in itself also looks like it has decent moisture levels. The pole, the plant hasn't really attached to the pole. Actually, one little root has attached to it. But the root isn't really attaching itself to the moss pole. It goes into the moss pole and then straight into the potting medium. So I don't need to water this. There's no point in me watering this moss pole just yet. Uh, I'll just keep watering the potting medium when I need to, or I basically water the bottom part of the pole and it just drips into the potting medium. So no need to water this. Maybe let's have a look at my sapinata. Sapinata, see how these roots are seeking moisture. So I want to make sure I provide these nodes with sufficient water so the roots can really thrive. But you can hear, there's no crunch. This moss pole is still sufficiently moist. The top, very crunchy, but I don't care. So this is also okay. Might just need a little top up halfway through the week, but definitely not today. And then let's have a look at the last one. The last one actually hasn't even attached to the moss pole at all. So let me just show you. It's just a cutting of uh, Jose Bueno cutting that I potted up in here. Right, so this is, the, this is the newest node. I want that newest node to attach to the moss pole, but it's not really giving me any signs of showing any aerial roots. Really, this plant was only potted up a few weeks ago. This plant is really going to focus on establishing a root system first before it's going to go and put any effort into new growth that can then attach to the moss pole. So you can see this plant is rooting well into the mix. You can see that mix is pretty dark and you can see a little bit of water evaporation in there. So there's still plenty of mix. Uh, there's still plenty of moisture. Keep in mind, there isn't a large root system. Like if you don't have a large root system, if you don't have a large plant, what exactly is going to use all of that water that you give it? So no need to water. Now down here, these ones are a little bit different. So hang on, let's put this aside. We're taking this to the bathtub. Let me take one out. Whoa. So these ones are on grow vertical moss pole. Grow vertical moss poles is like uh, basically just moss poles with a plastic backing. Um, they're a local company. And actually I've got a discount code now as well. I think if you use Sydney Plant Guy, you get 10% off any grow vertical poles. Let me reconfirm it and I'll pop it in the description if that's true. Really these um, plastic, because they have the plastic backing, there's less surface area, meaning that the moss is going to dry out less quickly. So I need to water this less often. Um, same principle applies. I can just squeeze the moss in here. I'm holding them so, we have, so the microphone can pick it up, by the way. I can tell that this doesn't really need watering. Um, so that's all good. And if we're looking at the potting medium in itself, there's plenty of condensation showing. So this plant is not in need for any watering. I noticed that I definitely water these grow vertical poles way less frequently. But with these grow verticals as well, because they're kind of like stuck in this shelf now and I can't be asked to take them out. The plastic also makes it really convenient and much neater for watering. So I don't worry about any splashback or I don't worry about any water actually, um, you know, going all over the walls because the plastic keeps it all a little bit con um, nice and clean. So I have no issues in just spraying the top of the moss pole a little bit, you know, I don't really need to water it, but I'm just making future Jan's life easier by stopping the moss pole from fully drying out. Another really good benefit of stopping your poles from drying out completely is that basically the, the moss poles, 
give my natural environment a bit of a humidity boost. All of these moss poles are kept nice and moist, meaning that there's always water evaporating from these moss poles, meaning it just gives my uh, humidity in this apartment a little boost. But of course, whenever you have high humidity in an apartment, make sure you have plenty of airflow. So I love keeping my windows open, specifically after watering day, or especially if I water plants and actually spray their leaves. I always, always, always turn on the fan as well because I don't want water to just be sitting there. You can also spray the surface of the moss pole a little bit, just where you want the roots to attach, just to give it better chances. But yeah, ultimately, I don't have to worry about these grow vertical poles quite as much. But I, I'm not the biggest fan of the plastic. Right, I think this is the last one. So what I've done here is I've got it in a pot. The pot is sitting on another pot in a planter, meaning that again, the pot is never touching the bottom of that planter. So if any excess water drains all the way through and accumulates at the bottom of the planter, my medium is not in touch with it. So I don't need to worry about my medium being too moist. So I can pretty much just water this as much as I want. And any excess water, it's just gonna drain through. So I'll just pour water all over it. And again, if I would do this, if I wait to do this for the moss pot to dry out fully, this would make a mess and the water would go everywhere. But because I'm watering before the moss pot fully dries out, I can just pour water all over it without making any mess and without it taking a whole lot of time. All right, that almost took a liter of water in like, I don't know, 20 seconds or so. so. There should be plenty. All right, I think that's it. Let me collect all my empty bottles. So uh, that gave my anthuriums plenty of time to fully drain. So I can now pop them back into the cabinet. All right, let's maybe speed that up. All right, done. We're almost done. We're getting so close. Couple more things. Let's look after all of the plants that I need to do a bit of pest treatment for. So. Follow me to the bathroom. Alrighty, so we've got those four plants. They're in here because either they have pests or they have too much dust and cat hair on them or because I want to water them and it would get too messy where they were before. So um, I'll take my trusted pressure sprayer again. And first things first, before I spray any sort of pest stuff, I just spray them with water first. Good old water, just to wipe off all of the dust. Any pests that are sucking on there right now, let's, let's wipe them away first. Now, I will use pest treatment as well. So I use Comfidor spray for thrips. I use Vitality Plus for spider mites. I have a Q&A uh, where I talk about it in a little bit more detail. I like to do my pest treatment indoors because a lot of these have active ingredients that could be harmful to insects outdoors. So don't use these sort of things in your garden or outdoors. It's really just uh, meant to be used indoors. But I let the water evaporate first and then once the leaves are a little bit dry or drier, uh, then I'll start uh, using the spray. So I'll just give that an hour. So I come back, I just spray the, uh, spray the plants with Vitality Plus for spider mites and then I let them dry for another hour before I pop them back into their spots. All right. Remember that whenever I water, I catch all of the excess water in this bucket. Well, that water has plenty of fertilizer in it, so I want to use it. So I'll just give that to all of my plants on the balcony. We're not done with the watering yet, but editing this video, I realized that this is going to be a very, very long video. So I decided to split it into two parts. So this was just part one. I'll be releasing part two on Friday. So stay tuned. Or if you're watching this video after Friday, you should find part two over here. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe, like, and leave a nice comment. And I'll see you next time around. Bye.